Okay, so hello everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, second interview in the series on uh, interviews on mindful coaching. And uh, I'm here today with uh, Richard Strozzi Heckler, who is uh, the founder of Strozzi Institute and the founder of Somatic Coaching. And uh, he also has a PhD in psychology and uh, a six degree belt. Is that the, the black way to say it? Black belt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> in Aikido. So, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm very pleased and uh, honored as well. And I've really been looking forward to talking to Richard. Um, this practice, uh, somatic coaching, uh, has been really inspiring to me in my, in my work. And I, I call my work uh, mindful coaching. And um, the term mindful coaching to me uh, refers to ways of coaching practice that reflects uh, mindfulness philosophy. So mindfulness understood as a whole of ways of thinking and acting of being in the world. And uh, within this frame, I feel that somatic coaching is, uh, is a very um, important approach for me to integrate. Yeah. So um, the overall theme that I'm exploring within this series is um, this whole field of, of coaching. How is that changing and developing within this current mindfulness revolution, we might call it. So um, I'm looking forward to hear, Richard, uh, what you think about this topic and also to hear about uh, somatic coaching and and a little about your own way of uh, relating to your own practice of somatic coaching thank you thank you and it's it's um good to meet you camilla thank you, thank you. and now that you say my name i just remembered that i forgot to introduce myself <laughs> that might be a good idea as well so my name is Camilla Wilbach, um, and I'm a yoga teacher, a master coach, um, and also uh, working with leadership development. Yeah, so this is me. And uh, Richard, I would very much like to start off with the question, what do you think... Um, or oh, how would you describe, I might say, the core insights in somatic coaching? The, the notion of somatic coaching is that we are a unified whole. So it's not so much that we see mind, bodies and spirits, but the <clears throat> sum total of all of our history, our yearnings, our longings, our wounds, our, our healings, um, uh, our roles, all those things take place in this, in this form that we call the soma. Now, um, we can interchange soma with body, but, you know, when people think of body in the West, they'll either think of all, somebody on a magazine cover or an athlete or somebody with the right dress or the right figure or, or whatever. Mm. So we say that uh, the way that we think, the way that we feel, our emotions, our moods, our actions, our perceptions are all taking place within this form. And in order to uh, uh, learn, transform, modify, change ourselves, mm. it's really possible to work through the soma. And that's, that's a very, very core principle, that we can do this through the soma. And by doing it through the soma, what we do is we take on a particular set of practices that begin then to, to change the nervous system or the spirit of the person, if you will. That affects moods, emotions, behaviors, 
ways of being, ways of doing. And, and, and in that way, we were able to continue to evolve as we're, as we're built to evolve as a living organism. The, the human shape really is in an evolutionary process. And by working through this shape, we're able to, to, to transform ourselves. We often refer to the, the soma too as the shape of our experience. Our body is the shape of our experience. And so that through certain kind of training and building one's perceptions, you, you can see all these things that is in the human being. That the, As William Blake's, uh, the English poet and philosopher said, there's no body distinct from the soul. So we can have a view into the soul, the spirit, the attitudes, um, the ways of perception of a human being by the way that they move, mm. the way that they stand, the way that they act, the way they coordinate with other other people, for example. Yeah. So really this notion of, of practices, of uh, learning through the body, are really central to somatic coaching. Yeah. At some point you said something about... Uh, the nervous system, and then you said all the soul. Is that correct? The spirit, the soul, or the spirit, the spirit, yes, the nervous system and the spirit. You, there's some fine kind of correlation here, or I would say that you know, yeah, from the objective point of view, we know now because the, the uh, technologies in neuroscience can show it to us. That as we learn and change, our nervous system changes. Our, our brain actually changes, and it can change through a lifetime. Yeah. And that's a very strong scientific model. I think the, the uh, I'll, I'll divert to a minute by saying that I appreciate deeply all this new technology in neuroscience because it really grounds what human beings have known for millenniums and millenniums. I also reject the language of neuroscience because it is still scientific in nature and reductionistic. Okay. So when I say nervous system, it's at that point that I'll, I will also say something about, um, or the spirit of the person, the, the animus, what is the animating principle? What is this key or this energy that's moving through somebody mm -hmm. and how that can be modified and changed too, so that they can become wiser, more compassionate, more skillful in the world. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and um, this this um, way of uh, working with the coaching practice, how is that uh, different from a mainstream approach to coaching as you see it? You know, well, I don't. I don't want to get too much like in in um, comparisons. You know, my background is that uh, I uh, when I got my PhD, it was really on what was called then the relationship between the mind and the body, mind body harmony, and um, mm. and myself and my partners then did a lot of work inside of the healing profession: psychiatrist, psychologist, physicians, drug counselors etc cetera, etc cetera, to bring the body into uh, this work so I studied different forms of body work and it was out of this that at some point I realized that uh, really what I was doing in many cases is I was coaching people yeah which was okay. different than the, than the therapeutic model you know which I had a lot of experience in and had done that but um, so I'm a little bit hesitant to compare it to the larger um, Uh, coaching world necessarily mm -hmm. um, but I think that what is does distinguish it, us from most things is that we don't just see that the body is just a part of something we say uh, in a piece and then the rest is conversational we say it's important to to, to pay attention to the shape mm -hmm. that we are yeah. and that the shape in, in all of its all of its forms and what that means is that we pay attention to sensation We pay attention to breath patterns, we pay attention to our posture, how we're standing with another person. Mm -hmm. We're able to see how we relate to pressure through our bodies. So there's a number of those distinctions in which we, we, we focus on. And I think a lot of the power, Camilla, is that 
in the West particularly, there's such a division between our thinking self and our feeling self. And so the first principle in somatic coaching is to bring in your attention to your feeling self. And that's bringing your attention to your sensation. And I don't mean feeling like I have a feeling, but actually I'm starting to feel this life force that moves through me. Mm. And this life force that animates everything that I, I do. And um, what we claim is that in this life force, there's a tremendous amount of intelligence. Mm. There's a tremendous amount of intelligence around how we can um, be, let me say, life affirming. Okay. And um, I would say that uh, arguably one of the reasons that we can so easily stain our water and pollute our air is because we've lost touch with our feeling self. And one of the reasons that there's there's a big gap between those that have and those that don't have is for the same reason. And one of the reasons that so much conflict will very quickly precipitate into violence is because we've lost touch with this, this sense of, uh, of feeling and sensing. And that occurs only in our bodies. And so it's important to bring our attention to the life of our body. Mm -hmm. And we're coming off of a long history, as you know, 600 year history of the importance of rational thinking yeah. and uh, discursive mm -hmm. thinking and logic. And this doesn't mean we have to give that up. We are rational beings, too. Yeah. And um, to be analytical is important in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but it's imbalanced. Yeah. And we've made our, our world imbalanced. And I would go as far to say is that there's an illness in the world. We're ill. And our planet is beginning to reflect that back to us. And one of the intentions of somatic coaching is to be able to bring some powerful medicine to that illness mm. so that there's more uh, attention how we treat our environment and how we're inter interdependent with it that there's more possibilities for social equity with people, both in race and class and gender, and that people can be lifelong learners and be have a both a, uh, a successful professional life and a fulfilled life all total. Hmm. These are very beautiful purposes to have <laughs> um, by yes. doing a coaching practice. Yeah, certainly. And so this illness, you might say this is cutting off other forms of intelligence than the rational one. Could, could you describe it like that? That would be that would be one way of saying that that mm -hmm. we've really shrunk or atrophied this. Um, to be specific, the sense of like empathy or compassion mm -hmm. is not seeing somebody as the opposite or opposed or very, very different, but recognizing that there's a deep web of connection that we have with all of life. Yeah. And um, that deep web, web of connection with life um, allows this opportunity to, to, to be able to heal the ways that we polluted and uh, stained the environment in the way that we have made huge divisions among people yeah. that lead to aggression and warfare and mm. conflict. That totally makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> and we're talking about um, an intelligence in our life energy, like life force. I heard you talk about this before. It's the chi, it's chi in China. Or there's different names for it in different um, parts of uh, history and in the world. Um, how how can we understand this intelligence? First thing we must do is we must bring our attention um, to sensation. That's the first step. And sensation is the building block of life. So, for example, if like in our courses and when we work with organizations, we teach people meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started doing this 25, 30 years ago, people... When I bring that up, they would say um, they would have the, uh, you know, the image of somebody 
with a white beard and in this long flowing robes are a, are a picture of the Beatles or something. Mm. Mm -hmm. And um, so much has changed since then. But what we did is we began to call it attention training. Yeah. And that you can actually train your attention. And we said the way to start is to basically bring your attention to your breath. And um, either at the nostrils, where there's the sensation of the breath of the, moving through the nostrils, or the abdomen and torso, the rising and falling of that, the, the torso. And once we begin to see that, we see that this, this, this energy, as you said, it's said many different ways in many different cultures. Mm -hmm. um, in English, we say energy, but it's... That's more that it comes off from physics, and the other many other cultures, especially in Asia, have made that word more potent and made it seem bigger than all those things. Um, and once we begin to um, uh, attend to this life energy, we begin to see that it that it moves towards connection. Okay. Life moves towards connection. The, the dream of every cell is to become two to reproduce, is to multiply, is to grow, get into groups, is in the communities and um, teams and, and even even nations or tribes, for the, example. This, this part, uh, getting into teams or communities, how do we experience that? Dividing is like, this is uh, perfectly fine for the rational mind to understand, but <laughs> where does this other experience come from? Um, what we be, when we begin to live in the life of our body, mm -hmm. we begin to see experience quite directly that we have a very, very powerful urge towards uh, interdependence. And that really we're not doing very much at all alone. And in the West, the whole stories are how you are doing this piece for yourself. But really, there's many, many other elements and people who are connected to allow us to transform mm. and to change. Mm. We turn on the light switch and we go, I just turned on the lights. And we don't realize there's this vast network that has made that happen. <laughs> so we, we begin to feel that in a very direct way. Mm. We begin to feel this interdependence and interconnectedness in a very direct way with other humans. And we, if we go, continue to deepen into it, we see that that is also a very immediate and direct experience with nature, our landscape, mm. our water, our food, the four-legged animals that are out there, those that crawl, the sky, etc. Mm. And we can have these moments. And many people, even though we live in a very rationalistic society, Many people can remember this moment where they took a certain action and they just said, God, it was unthought. I didn't even think it through or it wasn't even logical, but I just took this particular action. They may say it was intuitive. Yeah. And what we say, that comes from deep inside of us. That comes from the soma. Mm -hmm. And the more that we allow ourselves to listen to our that life force, the, the more that we're able to um to to act from it and and this particular knowledge about the soma that you just described how do you use that like you know very, if you can explain like very very concrete how do you use that when in the coaching session um what what what's critical from somatic coaching point of view is the primacy of relationship So a coach can go in a coaching session and be very smart and be very bright and being able to see a sequencing of things, but they have not built the capacity to feel the other person, to really be with them on a felt sense, to acknowledge their, basically acknowledge their livingness. Mm -hmm. and, and even though we, most of us live in disembodied cultures, other people can feel that. They can feel that the other person is talking at them or giving them good advice, but they're, they're not um, sensing or feeling into them. And we say this is a critical piece of it. This, this is one of the things that builds trust for people. Mm -hmm. I was doing a training module the other day, 
and a person um, spoke about something that was very, very vulnerable and transparent for him, yeah. This, yeah. this man. And one of the people practicing coaching gave him an academic in a quite, you know, it was smart, and it was to the point, quite ac academic um, reflection on what he was doing, but he really missed the person. Mm. He really missed him, and that person could feel it. Yeah. And uh, so what needs to come first is this energetic felt sense of connection. In Japanese through Aikido, we call it musubi. Okay. It's called mus musubi. musubi. And what that means, it means like a knot. Okay. So in the martial arts, what that means is you tie in with your partner. You tie so you don't in? try to separate from your partner to push them away or throw them down. The first thing you do is you tie your energy in with their energy and you're able to move mm. and guide their energy in a certain kind of way. Yeah. And then attention, um, energy follows attention. Mm -hmm. Intention comes from our, our projections of thoughts, memories, imagination, and hopes for the future. So by uh, tying into that energy, what we're able to do is to more fully move with the person and the other part of it is, I would say it helps build trust with people. Yeah, I can really see the Aikido metaphors here, <laughs> you know, about the working with the energy and yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, could, could you maybe um, tell me a little about when you're in a coaching session, how do you experience um, yourself, you know, from the inside or on, on the inside, um, your way of uh, connecting. What? Um, how do you um, guide your own attention? Um, the first thing is that uh, what's important is the what I do is that I bring my attention to the life of my body. I feel my sit bones on the chair. Mm. I feel my back against the chair. I feel my hands. If I'm if I'm if I'm talk in the conversational sense, some of my work is I do body work where the person's lying down, yeah. or we'll even stand and do movement work. But in any case, it's a way that I'm I begin to locate myself inside of myself. So I'm just I, I can take content. I can remember things. I can remember sequences. But also I bring in the sense of um, what's what's my heart center or what is the area in my chest telling me what about my belly center what's what's occurring there and what that does is that allows me to be there um, more fully than just a mind that's taking in information but a, 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 a multi-layered transparent human being that's connected to another one and then from there, what I do is, is there's an extension of your energy, my energy out towards the other person. That's not leaving myself. That's not merging in them. That's not becoming codependent. It's that field of tying in with them. Mm. So as the attention moves out, energy will fall and begin to touch that other person at the same time. And then the skill for the somatic coach is to go, what's too much and what's too little there? Because if your attention is too strong or too probing for that shape, they can contract around it. If it's too light or not enough, they're unable to meet you in some way. So you're gathering attention, uh, you're gathering information about the person. In a sense, you're gathering who they are the way that you extend your energy out to them. And then I, I listen really carefully to what wants to come to form, what wants to now have life. Has there been long withheld joy, long withheld rage, uh, long withheld an inquiry into the nature of this next transition of my life? Mm. And so what begins to fall off are all those things that people have inherited or they've adopted and they get closer and closer to themselves about inside of myself what now um, seeks um, shape, seeks contact mm. with, the, with the world. Mm. And then with that, 
feeling like what what that is coming forward is very interesting because people can say one thing and their body will say another thing. Yeah. I mean, I've heard people say things like this. Um, you know, my commitment here is to learn how to be a better manager. And as they're saying it, their, their, their head is going, no. <laughs> really? <laughs> and so we'd say, I hear what you're saying and that's important, but can you say something about what is this that's going on? Hmm. And they may go in there and going, no, that is something important, but you know what else is really most important is that I don't have any work-life balance. Ah. I don't get to see my children enough. Mm. And it brings me a kind of a sorrow and a grief. And, and do you, oh, now you go all the frozen body again. The body will tell us really deeply. Oh, sorry, Richard. It's what, what's just under froze. what that is. Can, can you say that sentence again? Because otherwise I won't be able to hear all of it. Just the last one because you froze. Can you remind me what it was? <laughs> yeah. what, was it, what was the last one? Um, well, let me just try. Yeah. They, 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 um, uh, the body, the body uh, is not tactical. Mm. You might have a tactical or a strategic idea about where we're going, mm -hmm. but in terms of our deep sense of satisfaction, our deep sense of pleasure, our deep sense of really fulfilling what is our destiny, that energy moving through us can inform us of that. Mm. So in that sense, the body's not tactical. And then, or not it, then what it will is it? say, this is what, this is what brings me satisfaction. Mm. This is what will make me more whole. And if we learn how to listen to it carefully, we know how to bring that to form and shape. Mm. And, and when in a coaching session, you said, I will tune into my heart or into my belly and feel what is going on. And, and how do you mm, use this sensation in the coaching practice? I think the most important thing that if you are a leader, you're coaching, mm -hmm. you're an advocate for people, is that you have to, you have to love people. You have to genuinely love people and you have to hold them in a context of uh, they're the authority and I will work with them so that they're able to bring the best self of them out in that way. Yeah. And uh, one of the ways to do that is to bring your attention to your heart center hmm. and then maybe connect your heart center with your eyes. So we can do that right now is that I'm looking at you, your viewers are looking here. If you drop your attention to your heart center, if that's hard to do, just put your hand there and you can feel the sensation of the hand, right? With those big pumps, the lungs and the heart. Mm. And yeah. whatever you feel there, let that feeling also occur in your eyes, which is a very exposed part of our nervous system. If we begin to shape ourselves and, and, and move our attention in this particular kind of way, the world will begin to appear differently. Mm. Just as if my shoulders are up like this, the world will appear a certain way. Yeah. If I'm doing this, the world will appear a certain way. <laughs> if I bring my attention, drop my attention out of my thinking self into my heart, allow that to be connected to my speech into my eyes will bring forward a different world. Mm. Yeah. So that's 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 what it is to to be able to move through these different places of emotion, mood, perception, action. Mm. You know, the belly center, hara, tantian, tanden, kath, supi say kath, is really they say the the center of will and volition and action. Heart center, uh, where the thymus gland is, is really the, the center of um, empathy, love. Um, from here, we're neither grasping nor are we pushing away. We're just being with what is. And then the eye center is, we can say, has to do with long horizons of time, maybe as long as eternity, mm -hmm. and seeing a big picture and being able to relax in a big picture, and also being able to, to allow ourselves to surrender more to the mystery. 
What do you think about that? What I'm saying. Um, well, I'm I'm actually not thinking a lot. I'm feeling a lot or sensing a lot. I'm I'm mm -hmm. I'm um, I'm directing my attention into my body when you're saying that to sort of feel the places in a body mm -hmm. you're referring to so um, <laughs> i'm not very much up here up here okay. at this moment <laughs> um yeah and at some point i was thinking hmm that's richard Strozzi guy he's um he's very um abstract thinking for a body worker <laughs> Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Well, I consider I, I like the world of ideas. Yeah, yeah. That's, I like the world, that's, I like that's the world of ideas. Good. I like the world yeah. of thinking, and I like to, um, uh, you know, as you know, I, I've written nine books. Mm -hmm. I appreciate writing and poetry, and what it means to be able to form a world through language as well. Mm. Yeah. You know, in semantics, we say that um, you know we are biological beings or historical beings yeah uh we're, we're linguistic beings and we're social beings yeah. and these all happen in the soma yeah and, and, you, and um, you're saying perceiving is part of the soma yeah perceiving is of course a part of the soma but also understanding what's happening in the consciousness is part of the soma as well so absolutely. there wouldn't be any uh clash <laughs> between these two in your understanding right no no not at all no not at all. no <laughs> so you you were talking about that manager or some manager saying i want to be a better manager and then nodding his head nodding this is nodding no this uh, this is nodding that's nodding yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is this <laughs> um Saying no with his head. <laughs> you, have good, you have good English, though. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, but shaking his head, we could say, yeah. And when when you work into this, do you work uh, into the movement? Like, for example, ask him asking to shake his head again and and get into the sensation of this, or what does it mean? Or do you just work with it uh, by words or? First, the first thing is to bring their attention to it. Mm -hmm. Say, I noticed this while you were saying this, yeah. your body was doing something else. Mm -hmm. You say you're relaxed and your ears are up here. You say you're you're uh, happy to be here and you're not breathing very deeply. Do you notice those differences, that, that d dissonance? And they may say, I don't notice. And I said, well, Let's try this. Why don't you say it again? And then they may notice it. So it becomes in the field of their awareness at that point. Mm -hmm. And then there's ways to coax it in their field of awareness, like say, go ahead and say the same thing and do this. Or go ahead and say the same thing and, and bring your shoulders up. Yeah. Yeah. And then we may, some people don't have that distinction. So you have to work with them in making that distinction. They don't have that distinction? Well, they go... Well, just between uh, the sensation like, and the logical thinking, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, okay. They might say, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing with my forehead. I don't feel that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, the, I, I recognize that. Back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. So, I think I would like to ask you... Um, what kind of um, understanding of the world mindfulness makes the most sense to you? When I think of mindfulness, Camilla, I think of meditation. Mm. And I remember very early on when Johnny Kabat-Zinn, John Kabat-Zinn was developing this. And he, 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 I was doing a project back east and he was kind enough to invite me with his family in for I think it was Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, we have, we, we have this holiday Thanksgiving here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I saw some American movies once in a while. <laughs> yeah, I, I I always try to be careful with that because you know we can become very American centric here. Yeah, and just say these things where it means nothing to others. 
Um, and uh, hmm? he, he, he was coming from a, a meditation background, and but he began to arrange it or work with it in a different way and doing a lot of tests with it in, in, in the, you know, the uh, hospital in Massachusetts. Wonderful work. But essentially, I think of it as meditation. Mm. And meditation in, the, in, in this sense that um, while there's many things that can come from meditation and mindfulness, it certainly increases awareness. Mm. And what we do know is that uh, choice follows awareness. So the more aware we are, the more choice we have. Yeah, sure. And when we allow ourselves to live in our choice, we have more agency mm. and we have more autonomy. There's another step economy? after that. Economy? Auto autonomy. Yeah, oh, we, oh, we autonomy. have a sense of that. Yeah, okay. Autonomy. Auto yeah, sure. And then from there, so that, that's how I think of mindfulness. It's always like meditation, mindfulness, even in this conversation. Yeah. Having a practice where we, we do, I do a meditation practice daily. Mm -hmm. Part of our coaching package here is we ask people to do meditation retreats. That could be walking. Uh, Aikido can be a form of meditation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's just, uh, you know, I've started meditation retreats at the, in the military and the Pentagon here in America. And it's just a very, very important thing to have. But people can become more aware and have more choice, but not act on the choice. Mm. And that's a whole next step to be able to act on that choice where they're um, engaging in their volition or their will, organizing themselves and saying, now I'm going to take this action. And then following the action, what's important is accountability and being accountable for the actions. Mm -hmm. So that whole pl place of awareness, choice, volition, action, and uh, uh, accountability are really critical. Yeah, and I hear that you're saying that these are building upon the awareness. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Mm. So, and I heard you... Um, in another interview, uh, you you were telling about that you have been doing meditation for like 30 years, I think you said. Over 45 years now. 45 years? Over wow. 45 years, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a long time. <laughs> um, so, and you say mindfulness to you is meditation. So coming from there... How do you see the connection between mindfulness and somatic coaching? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, let me just say is that uh, I say that about mindfulness because I'm respectful that it's really increasing as its own discipline. And it could be different than meditation. But I've never like done a mindfulness course. But I've done a lot of meditation courses. So... Uh, the 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 connection is the really the fundamental vital importance of being able to train our attention instead of our attention just running all over the place giving force to all these emotions and moods that we're just acting out of without awareness and choice mm. causes a lot of mischief and be, be, by becoming more aware and more mindful inside of coaching and, and building that, you know, in my book, The Anatomy of Change, I called, I called attention the organ of attention, like a muscle or even like an organ mm. that you can develop. And what that does is that produces a different kind of observer in the person. So, so they begin to... A different kind of observer. Mm. A different way of seeing mm. the world. Mm. And we begin to realize that, you know, what do we say? There's there's research that there's something like we have 95,000 thoughts a day. Yeah. And about 85,000 of those are the same thoughts we had yesterday. Yeah. So this thing is just doing all this. And if we believe it, if we believe all that things and mm -hmm. the emotions, we're just going off all these different places. Yeah. 
But if we find a center inside of it where we're just observing it, it enhances our capacity to act and to choose. Hmm. So when you say a different kind of observer, you mean like going from the ego to the soul or something like this? Or no, not the soul, but you know, um, when we observe what we feel, what we think, uh, what we sense, all this, all this content of our self, we get the implicit uh, experience of the observer. And this is the different observer you're referring to. Is that correct? Observer in the sense that, that <clears throat> there's a space, mm -hmm. there's more space for this perception to be able to observe and to see all of these thoughts, like where they emerge from, how they come to form, yeah. how they die out, and the next one comes up, yeah. as with emotions and as with moods, yeah. and that we don't necessarily have to be caught in all of them. Mm. So there's a space that's created. Yeah, and this is what I was saying. I, I just wasn't very clear, <laughs> it seems. Okay, um, I have to just check the time. Oh, we have a little time left. Um, what 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 would be like your own daily practice to uh, cultivate this uh, attention and this way of working within the coaching sessions and the teaching and everything that you do? For some time, my, my daily practice has been I get up and I sit, mm. I meditate, I have a meditation practice. Um, then I live on a piece of property, a, a, a ranch here, Okay. and I, I, I um, get up and I have a joe, which is a staff, a Japanese staff, and um, I will uh, take a walk on the property. Or go across into my neighbor's property and sometimes I would take you know when the dogs were here I'd take the dogs or the animals would come with me and I practice walking in a centered way okay. centered way so I'm paying attention to my length my width and my depth mm -hmm. and I'm moving from my movement center I'm moving from my belly center yeah. from Hara Hara yeah. as they say in Japanese Hara means belly. And then from there, um, I'll come back to a clearing that I always come back to. And I do this set of 31 moves with the Joe. Okay. And I do that three times. And then I do these cuts with the Joe. And the first cut are is my, my, big, my big commitments, my life commitments throughout my life. I do that 10 times, and then the next 10 are, are strikes about specifically what it is that I'm committed to in the closer in uh, horizons of time. Mm. And that's what I do. And then I think, you know, I've done what's important. I've had my conversations with God. Um, I've um, uh, been outside under the big blue lake of sky. Um, I've moved my body, and the rest of what I do um, during the day is, as we say in English here, gravy. Gravy, yeah. I've done the, I've done the important thing. I've gone to the, yeah. the well and taken a drink. Yeah, and this, the rest is just extra add-ons. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So, hmm, at this particular moment, what is it that you're committed to or excited about? In your professional life, I'm in the, pro I'm in the process of writing another book, yeah. and the book is entitled "Embodying the Mystery: okay. Notes from a Somatic Pilgrim." So I just want to write some kinds of stories about the, the beautiful experiences I've had, the, the masterful, wonderful teachers that have uh, occurred, and um, so I think that can be in this field. A contribution would be my idea. I'm 
very committed to having what's in my body, in my soma, and being able to put it in other people's somas. In other words, teach teachers. Yeah. yeah sounds like a the very joyous thing. book to write. What's that? Like a, like a very joyful book to write, it sounds. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Mm. That's what it feels like. And if I get too busy and get away from it, I really long to go back to it. Mm. And also that um, uh, I'm part of a project. Um, I'm a co-founder of the Mideast Aikido Project, where we bring people who are been in conflict for generations, warring conflict for generations, and have them do Aikido together, okay. both in um, the Middle East and also in East Africa. Wow. So we're building the whole possibility is the practice of Aikido kind of, could it be a second track diplomacy, another way in, in which people can work out their problems. Sounds very interesting. It's very, very exciting. Mm. Very exciting. We, we just opened a new dojo in Ethiopia. Wow. And very uh, important Latin. work it, as well. What? Very important work as well. Mm -hmm. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Just finished a what we call training across borders that was in Greece. And we had people, you know, like who, like I said, these countries have been in, in conflict for a long time mm. and, and training Aikido together. Mm -hmm. oh, I really feel like doing some Aikido after talking to you <laughs> Richard right. yeah um, I have a very good friend teaching Aikido so I will do that but Richard is there any uh, specific resources that you would like to refer to before we end our conversation yeah thank you I'd like to have your your viewers know that if they are further interested mm -hmm. in this work, mm -hmm. they can go to Strozzi Institute, S-T-R-O-Z-Z-I, mm -hmm. Institute, I-N-S-T-I-T-U-T-E, dot com. Um, or they could Google me, Richard Strozzi Heckler, mm -hmm. and then you can see the kind of work uh, that we're doing and, um, uh, and what, how, what we're building. Also, the last book I wrote was called The Art of Somatic Coaching. Mm. I know that this, your piece here is around coaching. And it's called The Art of Somatic Coaching. And it's embodying pragmatic wisdom, grounded compassion, and skillful action. I would say those things. But the Institute and Googling my name yeah. will bring up a lot of possibilities. Mm. Thank you very much. And I will make sure to write the Sturzy Institute and also your book uh, on my web website when, when uh, posting our conversation. Thank so you so much. It will be easy to people to find you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. <laughs> I, I think I could have talked for another hour I have a lot more questions, <laughs> but uh, I really enjoyed it, and uh, it was so interesting as well. Very good. It was good to get to know you, and maybe when you're visiting America, um, yeah. we'll meet. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, that might be possible, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Richard. Have okay, a good Camilla. Day. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye.